Great. I'm so used to doing meetings and not webinars where I get to see everybody. So I'm just, we get to see each other. And actually, where did Sasha just go? <laughs> Sasha, come back. Sasha, come back. Well, I'm, I guess I'll just start. And then Sasha's just suddenly going to reappear. reappear. Um, yeah. Okay, great. Well, hello, everyone. My name is Amy Dufault, and I am a sustainable fashion journalist and storyteller. I do, I work as a consultant and do communications for lots of different businesses, including with Kathy Hattori and Botanical Colors. So, uh, <laughs> um, and my number one passion is natural dyeing. So I'm honored to be with soon four people as soon as we get Sasha back, but um, I'm just gonna just kind of keep going. Um, so the panel, the, the title of it is Natural Dyes as a Connector to Farming and History. And we'll be talking about, you know, the idea of how can natural dyes both connect us to our complicated histories and serve as a teaching tool from the blemish of African enslavement to grow both cotton and indigo in the United States to modern textile practices that demand speed and slave wages, we have never gotten textiles right and natural dyes for people and planet. So what are we going to do about it? And what are the most logical, equitable and environmental next steps? So today's discussion is with four leading voices in the natural dye world. And I am so excited that we're all here together. It's like powerhouse, powerhouse uh, people here. And um, so I'm honored to introduce Porfirio Guitierrez, Kathy Hattori, I try to break it up, man, woman, man, woman, uh, Abu Bakar Fofana, and Sasha Dorr. So when we all talked uh, to, you know, before to prepare for today, we decided to switch things up a little bit and tell you sort of like a story in four chapters, which each dyer is going to represent. Our story today is about having a commitment to natural dyes, both for people and planet, and how these four came to be so significant in bettering and, for, bettering and furthering the industry. And we're going to start with Porfirio, who is going to focus on what it means to commit to a culture and ancient natural dye techniques. But first, <laughs> I'm gonna introduce Porfirio. So, um, Porfirio is a Zapotec textile artist, natural dyer, researcher, educator, and is known internationally for his exceptional devotion to the textile traditions of his home pueblo of, I've never said this out loud, Teotitlan, am I saying it right, Del Valle in Oaxaca, a richly historic Zapotec textile community. His mission has been reinvigorating and preserving natural dyeing techniques for future generations while living both in Ventura and in Oaxaca. Um, Porfirio's work brings awareness to a profound spiritual belief that nature is a living being sacred and honored. He has been recognized by leading organizations such as the Smithsonian Museum of the American Indian, Harvard University's Forbes Pigment Collection, and the International Folk Art Market for his tireless work and commitment to his native culture. So, um, Porfirio, do you want me to share that image? That sure, please. Or okay, all right. Let me see here. Yeah. Oh, sorry about that. I'm going to close that out for a minute. Watch me suddenly make myself disappear. Okay. All right, and that, and that. Glad we've done this a couple times so that. It's not our first time at the rodeo. All right. Saxtildad, Saxtildad, Kachina Dinaro, Kachina Dinave, Vare, Vare, Rave, Bazone Dius, Navalash de Yutu, reciban un cordial saludo de un pueblo ancestral, Yotitlan del Valle, Lugar de los Dioses. Please receive greetings from an ancestral community, Yotitlan del Valle, the place of gods. I was fortunate and blessed to be born in a culture. And, and in a family that still holds and have and preserves the traditional knowledge and the worldview of the Zapotec people, the ancestors who have settled in the, this part of the world 
Mesoamerica thousands of years ago. When I talk about natural dye, I also refer to the parallel with language, with farming. I grew up from a family that their life has been devoted to farming for corn, beans, and squash, collecting the plants for the dyes and weaving. I remember as a young boy, my father, when someone asked my father what was his profession, he would always say, soy un artesano y soy campesino. That means I am an artisan and a farmer. It is an honor for me to be here and humble to be sharing this uh, time with, with all of you and, and, and my colleagues here who I deeply respect. Thank you. Thanks, Porfirio. I feel like a switchboard operator a little bit with this, so bear with me um, with the images. So um, without the base of knowledge of what was before us and committing to the foundations of that culture and its natural dye and textile practices, there is no story. And without farming, we have no dye plants. So we're gonna turn to our good friend, Abu Bakar Fofana, who's going to talk to his, about his commitment, not only to farming indigo and Mali, but how farming for food and medicine come into play within his community. But first, a little bit about Abu Bakar. Um, Abu Bakar is a multidisciplinary artist and designer whose working mediums include calligraphy, textiles, and natural dyes. He is known for his work in re for reinvigorating and redefining West African indigo dyeing techniques, and much of his focus is devoted to the preservation and reinterpretation of traditional West African textile and natural dyeing techniques and materials. He is currently deeply involved in creating a farm in conjunction with the local community in the district of, I didn't, I don't, don't know how to pronounce this right. I was going to ask you, I know we had some technical difficulties. Is it yeah. CB? CB? CB. CB. Mali, yeah. in which two types of indigenous West African indigo will be the centerpiece for a permaculture model based around local food, medicine, and dye plants. This project uh, hopes to contribute to the rebirth of fermented indigo dyeing in Mali and beyond and represents his life's greatest project to date. So um, Abu Bakr, do you want me to share your, your yes, image? Please. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Amy. Welcome. So, yeah, so what's my motivation and my commitment? Um, uh, showing that picture, that image, uh, it's come to me that I want to tell um, a very uh, short story uh, in uh, this belief, West African belief, uh, Malian belief, if I have to say, or Bamanan belief. This is a uh, something I can call like a, a blank page. Uh, I'm a visual artist, fiber artist, and uh, I have an approach to that land as a piece of artwork. So I mean, it's going to be my uh, uh, most important body of artwork in my, in my life. I would say this is my approach to that land. And the small story I want to tell is uh, from that, that uh, West African Malian belief, Malian cosmo, cosmogony belief. Um, uh, when uh, God created the universe, he left things unfinished. And then it's the role of human, as of course, by creating this universe, he did breathe life into all beings, living beings, things, if I can say so, animate or non-animate. So human beings in his action is continuing the work of God, if I can say. And there is a very important word in Bamanankan, which said Dani or Dali. It's like a sowing seed in earth. And it also the same word would reflect creation or procreation. And I think uh, that's something that was really talking to me. 
and uh, by uh, you know being in contact with this land my first things have been to heal the land first and of course the work i'm initiating is a commune work i know of course that i won't finish that work but i did initiate that work with a different community in this place uh, by uh, healing the land reforesting growing um, different uh, crop food crop and also medicinal plants and because as uh, I remember as a young boy, one word from my grandmother, uh, she was a healer. And the first thing she used to say to us is that our first medicine is food or our, no, our first medicine is food. So we are what we eat in certain way. And uh, I think those uh, words are still resonating in my mind, in my head. And uh, yes, I think that uh, this is really a lifetime commitment for me. And uh, I came to natural dyes first as a medicinal plant, not as dyes, but as a medicinal plant, if I have to take the example of uh, indigo. And uh, yeah, see, so this is what I wanted to share with you. Thank you. Thanks, Abu Bakr. Let's see. Okay. So um, a different type of community that, um, making sure I'm, I'm not muted. Okay, a uh, different type of community that we live in most of the time, a lot of us live in most of the time is our online community. And so how do we commit to storytelling and beauty in an authentic way when we have to live so much online? Sasha Dur is well known for sharing her color stories that widen our color senses and has, I've been fascinated with Sasha's work and her on, online interpretations of natural dyes for, I guess, at least a decade now, Sasha. And so anyways, we're going to be having you talk about um, your kind of commitment to beauty and color and, and doing that in an online community, but first a little bit about you. So Sasha is an artist, designer, and educator who works with plant-based palettes. She centers her practice and research on the collaborative color potential of weeds, food, and floral waste, as well as seasonal ingredients. An adjunct professor at the California College of Arts with a joint appointment in textiles and fine arts, Sasha teaches, consults, and lectures widely, designing curriculum and courses in the intersection of natural color slow food, slow fashion, and social practice. From dinners to die for, to weeding your wardrobe and seasonal color wheels that the New York Times just featured. Thanks. <laughs> um, she's um, also, yeah, been featured in the New York Times, American Craft Magazine, Selvage, and the Huffington Post. Sasha is the author of the Handbook of Natural Plant Dyes, Natural Color, and Natural Palettes, which is which just came out this year. It's a beautiful book. So uh, Sasha, do you want me to share your image too? Oh, we're gonna ask, can you unmute yourself? That would be lovely if you could okay. share my image. <laughs> <All right. laughs> I'm so glad I had these up and ready to <laughs> yeah. learn into it. Uh, okay. okay. I almost hit leave by mistake. I almost left you guys. Let's see. Let's see. There we go. Okay. Thank you for that introduction, Amy. Um, yeah, I would I would say that this image, although it's one, I think I end up taking a lot of photographs because to me it's the work of natural palettes and working with natural color is one that really is a continuous process of transformation um, and connection. And to me, I found over, you know, the, I guess, two decades that I've been working in this field, um, it's really participation and a practice. And in the sense that, um, 
there's so much to learn from these plants, particularly like in this image on the right, it's actually goldenrod from the Hudson Valley. And I know Stone Barns is located there in the Hudson Valley. And on the left is nettle. And even just getting to know what may even be considered weeds, you can see they're edible, medicinal, um, you know, social, um, ethnobotanical properties that all create value. And it's, it's really become a way of seeing or even visualizing different forms of connecting um, for me, but also working with students and being able to create experiences uh, through using these plants and these colors as ways of, you know, connecting to more meaningful work like in whatever sense that is, like whether it's opening your back door and getting to know the trees that are right outside and their potential. And I will say that almost every plant has medicinal value, even if it's not for you as a human, for maybe an insect or even the soil. And so it's considering all of these holistic ways of thinking. And I have truly enjoyed over the past like 15 years of being a professor, um, seeing all the different ways that people bring plants into their lives and these natural hues and colors in order to um, tell their stories and to work with each other and to find collaborative ways of creating authenticity and meaning. And absolutely like looking at the way that these hues are created and the ingredients and the stories behind them, there is no way you could create this same sense of meaning from a tube or, you know, just by mixing color that is uh, pre-created in a lab. It's just, you know, there's, there's that participation. And I think that participation is one in which um, really has the potential or even like a, a medicine even for how we are today <laughs> in our cultures and just thinking about, um, you know, disposability, because even taking like, for instance, working with the idea of cycles or systems, and even taking maybe something you don't care about in the back of your wardrobe, and then infusing it with your favorite herb as a hue. And, uh, you know, perhaps just giving you that new life, but maybe even connecting you to, um, you know, a collaborative exchange you had in growing that plant or sharing that plant. And even every time I connect with uh, Amy, our moderator, the last time she was, um, I saw her, she had a bundle of rosemary in her hand. And that was a dye we worked with together a couple of years ago. And, uh, you know, there's there's a whole experience of, of uh, I don't know, almost a language that's built around these plants in terms of being able to take it to the next level and understand and share and uh, engage our senses on all levels. Um, and it's a, it's, yeah, it's a very rewarding and deeply satisfying process. Thanks, Sasha. Thanks, Amy. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm sure there's probably questions that are coming in, but I'm, I've got my own questions that you guys are getting me thinking about too. Um, okay, so we are cultivating culture, we farm, we gather community, we inspire visually and forge collaborations, but there's one major piece missing. How do you sell natural dyes and curate them in a way that's thoughtful and good for people and planet so Kathy's going to share her commitment to this, which um, I know is a strong commitment for her and how people are responding, especially during a pandemic. But first, an introduction to Miss Kathy Hattori. <laughs> Kathy is the founder and president of Botanical Colors and markets natural dyes and pigments to crafters, artisans, and commercial clients. Kathy has been involved with textile since 1982, where she learned to natural dye in Santa Cruz. Kathy has studied with renowned natural dye teachers in the US and Europe, including Michelle Garcia, Denise Lambert, and John Marshall. She teaches and lectures about natural dyes and is sought after as a speaker about the sustainable use of natural dyes in a global textile, in global, uh, textile production. She's one of the nicest human beings you'll ever meet in your life. 
Kathy, would hey, you like Amy. to share your image? Let's go for it. Four for four? Please. Great. Thank you. What do you always say? Just one moment, please. One moment, please. I started my um, corporate career as a receptionist and it's never left me. <laughs> <laughs> There you go. Oh, hey. Oh, How hey. are you, everyone? Um, so this, this picture is me uh, at a local farm. It's actually the, I believe it's the oldest um, CSA in Washington State, which is where I live. And as you can see, I'm surrounded by their flower garden, which also we would... Um, use as a dye garden for classes that we held out at the farm uh, a few years back. And I, you know, I have to say that I didn't come to this with any huge plan. It just started evolving as I had these onward conversations with artists and dyers and people all over the world. Um, and then finally brands and retailers. So when I started thinking about natural dyes, I was really uh, someone who was practicing natural dyes on an individual level and, you know, just really enjoying the beauty of being able to get color from plants. And I was trained in kind of the classic sense where um, the ancient dye stuffs were the dye stuffs that I learned about first. And I didn't really pay much attention to things that were considered um, more ephemeral or not as long lasting or potentially didn't, I didn't understand the secrets that they held. So I pretty much didn't use them. And it's been in the last 10 years that I've really been exposed to people who are um, really examining like what other colors can be derived from, from things that are not traditional dye stuffs. And are these colors always textile colors or can they be made into other um, dyes? So that's been a very interesting inquiry for me. But the other thing that I found was that in the early part of, of working with natural dyes that almost all of the dyes were um, imported, meaning that the United States wasn't necessarily the best um, growing environment for a lot of these colors. But since that time, and, and really in the last five or so years, there have been many growers who have approached me and said, I want to grow this plant, shall we try it? And in fact, um, we were contacted by a, a cooperative that supports um, refugees, and they were growing um, a type of marigold that I'd never heard of, but it is the first picture that Porfirio showed where he's harvesting this little yellow flower. It's that same plant. And so um, I was pretty excited to find out that someone had been growing a quantity of this and that we were able to um, you know, purchase their harvest in order to both supply our own customers, but also serve as a supply for Porfirio right now because he's in California until it's safe enough to go back to his hometown. So it, it just felt good to be able to kind of help out a little and figure this out and that there were people that were actually growing this and had been growing it and making those connections. Um, right now we're really pushing to find out what's possible to supply the, the natural dye world from US sources. So it's been really interesting to speak with a number of growers in our area here. I'm in the Pacific Northwest. And so we have a, a really wonderful growing climate for many of the dyes. Um, and I'm really anxious to see what, what happens in 2021 uh, with these folks. Um, the other big part of what I do is to introduce the natural dye palette and the natural dye process to brands. And so if you're not in the fashion and apparel world, you may or may not be um, aware that it's a pretty, uh, it's a pretty dirty business, I guess is the best way to say it, that it's um, a huge 
a user of resources, water, electricity, energy, um, coal, gas, as well as the um, creation of clothing can be extremely um, oppressive to workers that they're not able to unionize or that they're actively prevented from achieving um, economic goals that would make their lives livable. Uh, and it, it occurs not only overseas, which I think we've seen a lot of um, those abuses have been brought to light by other organizations um, in working conditions for, for clothing and apparel, but it even happens here in the United States. So the uh, Los Angeles area is one of the largest um, cut and sew uh, regions in the United States and people there, unless they're working for um, a, a factory that actually would um, take care of its employers, employees that that these folks can, are easily exploitable and um, are struggling just in order to live. And so trying to find my way through these brands that have this very fraught relationship on both an environmental and a socio and cultural level has been super tricky. Um, we've landed on a number of different um, brands, typically not super huge ones, because it's easier to persuade a smaller company that has a philosophy that's closer to what we're trying to offer to move to natural dyes, use natural dyes, and promote natural dyes. And it's through this type of supply chain that we feel like the viability of natural dyes as a um, supply source as a dye source for these projects becomes larger and larger. Now, I do want to point out that there's one big piece that's missing, and that's the ability to be able to process the dyes so that they work in dye machinery. Because when you're operating on the scale of several thousand units, you're not really able to go out and pick a bunch of flowers and put them into a dye machine. There's an intermediate step in order to process it into a dye that then could be put into the machinery. Um, there's very little of that happening now, but I see that as a huge opportunity to change and create something that would be on a regional level so that if you're able to grow a certain dye stuff regionally to scale, then you you should have a processing plant nearby. And I know that agriculture does this all the time, where if you're growing um, onions for sit, for example, you are able to carefully process and pack those onions and get them ready for distribution very close, if not on site. So that's been kind of percolating in my mind as well is like what's that next step to to fill that hole and how would we do it and um, what does that opportunity bring all of you who are farmers and growers and and um, parts of this supply chain what does that bring you uh, as an opportunity to continue to use your land for multiple uses and uh, also create beautiful plant color and make it more available um, in your region and literally throughout the world. So that's kind of the path I'm on right now. Sometimes it gets really narrow. <laughs> Sometimes it gets a little dark, but it is super interesting. And I wake up every single day and think, oh yeah, what new color or what type of color or what can we do today um, that's gonna make things a little bit better. So thank you, Amy and, and everyone. Uh, Happy to share my story. Thanks, Kathy. Let's see. Um, oh, just want to see. I don't know if we have any. Um, oh, okay. I just didn't know if the if the chat was open or not. But you guys can feel free to ask some questions in here. I guess you know, kind of going back to to what the the title is of this talk: with natural dyes as a connector to farming and history. One of the things I think has been really interesting during the pandemic is getting to know all of you. I don't think I've ever said um, Porfirio or Abu Bakar's name 
so much in, in one year in my life, just from the, the classes, the feedback Fridays, kind of different things that we've been doing. Oh, and, and the three here have all been featured in uh, our video program that we had started called Feedback Friday, which we kicked off on Fridays. But, um, you know, some of the things we had to all connect with was how do you do this online? These guys are legendary and people come from far to, to have them teach. But when you have to teach online, what was, you know, that was, that was like a whole other experience. So how do we talk about farming? How do we talk about natural dyes and, and do all of this online has been a, a journey in itself. I don't know if, um, if any of you want to talk about that kind of how natural dyes is, have provided a way for you to connect to other farmers or your communities and during this time. So one of you guys, Porfirio, you want to talk to that at all? Sure. Um, well, it is farming the land. Um, if you if you're speaking within a uh, this context of natural dyeing, handmade farming, food, um, I mean th those are all interconnected. Some of the things that I have been meditating about for a while now is the importance of um, the food, the farming, um, clothing, and shelter, and these has been those those were the principal needs or the things that um, the people secured thousands of years. Some of these things I have been thinking about and uh, my existence of today in this environment, how my life is possible and the inheritance of these traditions. To me, what are the things that my ancestors has gone through and uh, the evolution of the um, of farming, especially specifically the Zapotec people contribute tremendously to the world in the agriculture sector. And uh, how does that relate today? What does that mean today, you know, with technology and how that connects that land, the principles to technology and like you say, how, how that is possible to be shared today? Um, well, that is the only way to share it's through technology as we're speaking now, how that could, you know, we can best make the best of it, of conveying the information, but also continue trying to preserve, specifically someone like me and Abu Bakr also struggles with this, that we live in these two worlds. That, you know, during this time, it is difficult to travel. I haven't traveled back home. So how you preserve that, how you keep it alive, how you communicate that uh, during this time. Yeah. Okay. And I know Abu Bakr, you've had, you know, challenges too with kind of being able to, you know, I think, I think you got the coronavirus, didn't I? I'm pretty sure that you had the coronavirus and there was this kind of in between time where you couldn't go home, you had to stay in another place and, and kind of shifting around a little bit. But, you know, how is, how yeah, is it for you to know. connect to your connecting, connecting to your farm in Mali? From, a distance. I was in, uh, lock, in the lockdown in France for almost seven months, and um, I did uh, contract uh, COVID uh, uh, probably on my way back from Indonesia in uh, mid March, and it was uh, like a few days after it was a uh, lockdown in France, and of course I've been um, missing all this uh, agriculture campaign with my team in Mali here, being in this lockdown in France, and I miss also all this uh, rainy season because we have two seasons. We have one uh, rainy season and one dry season. And uh, yes, but my team uh, did uh, an amazing work while I was away. <laughs> so that was uh, really wonderful. And I'm really glad, of course, because I had um, homesick for many months, you know, to come back uh, again and uh, uh, being able to share many things with uh, all these beautiful work they've done while I was away. Yeah, I mean, for me, you know, thinking about natural dyes is uh, because it's uh, living colors. And what's really interest me is uh, when you work with uh, living beings or living things, it's a constant questioning. 
I don't, of course, feel that as, uh, you know, an exact science, but more an art. And uh, the art of farming is uh, something in my own uh, culture because it's a very agriculture culture, community. And uh, this is something we are very um, aware of or we, when we are a child, to learn in the different um, initiatory society, the art of uh, farming or the art of war or the art of many different way of uh, being as human in this uh, ecosystem. And uh, I say it's really, human is a very little part of this ecosystem. And uh, we have still to remain very humble about um, that, um, that situation of uh, being uh, and I do think that uh, the really value for me, I mean, I mean, I would say in life is uh, ag agriculture is something amazing because nature don't produce waste. You know, in, there is no waste in, 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 in nature. Nature can regenerate itself, but uh, human activity is uh, what is, uh, you know, uh, making damage and uh, yeah, that damage is uh, is really is real in in our modern society you know and of course my one of my concern for what i'm doing is there is also this uh, environmental issues you know because i grew up uh, in a very um, beautiful uh, nature and generous nature and we've been uh, trained uh, many things you know by uh, the first thing is the respect for nature and just not saying, yes, we love nature because uh, we are nature ourselves. And this is a very important notion I will always keep in mind, you know, and all those activity, yeah, of course. And I also come to, the, to farming because I wanted to be autonomous with the uh, raw material, you know, having a good, uh, good dyes was very important, you know, and as an artist or as the creator in this way, I could also, you know, go to any art supplier and buy my colors, but um, I'm interested in, in the process um, in the in in life. Yes, I think that's the notion, you know, uh, life. Because you know, this uh, seed you sow and you let germinate, and then the plant become ma mature, and then you process the plant, and then you go to the making a dye from that plant. And with all this uh, amazing notion how, for example, green leaves can make blue. And when you come to process those plants and put them in a dye vat, uh, I'm talking about the fermentation leaves vats, and then uh, dealing with the living organism, you know? And uh, as a human being, we know that uh, we are not composed only with cells, but with bacteria as well. And when you come to that uh, notion of uh, working with living organism, you feel really tiny, really small, like uh, the bacteria you cannot see with your own eyes, but you have also this uh, faith to them. And uh, because you have to care about those life, you have to give them all that they need. And this is the only way they can give you what you are expecting from them, their beauty. Mm -hmm. And that's natural dye for me. Ah, that's beautiful. Uh, Sasha, I know, so these questions are just kind of popping in my head, not like fully thought out because um, I thought we were going to have more questions in the chat box, but that's totally fine because these, you're like my favorite people to hang out and talk with. So, but I know um, you grew up in Maine, right? Yes. You grew up in Maine. And yeah. I know you're in Hawaii right now. Mm -hmm. and that's where your other family members are, but I'm not sure. I know in your books and like just following you on Instagram, you have some really beautiful images of kind of what you're harvesting as you go from place to place. And even when I know when you got stuck in New Zealand, what a horrible place to be stuck in <laughs> until you got back to Hawaii, you know, you know being able to still do that kind of harvesting. So it's a different type of farming. You're farming something out, you're harvesting. But can you talk just a little bit about kind of your exploration into, I guess, being a farmer of sorts, harvesting in different places that you go to? Uh, yeah, I mean, I feel like 
one of the, I guess, essential seeds of the work that I love to do with plant dyes and natural colors is, you know, really just exploring the colors themselves through the plants. And it starts with the ingredients and it starts with just a curiosity. Um, and I feel very grateful that through my life and work and through teaching, I really pretty much just get to do color testing all the time and I love it. Um, and I feel that that has really been a solace and a centering point throughout 2020, but in general, because um, yeah, I would just say the more you widen your vocabulary in terms of learning about plants and working with them, and as well, just experimenting with natural dye processes and color making in general, the more you see that what you have even in your daily life can be a part of that process and participation. And so, you know, I've, I've even gotten many emails or letters from students or, you know, colleagues or even just people out of the blue saying that they feel very grateful, like in lockdown or even in shelter in place, that they can still find this creativity, like in their daily life, in their backyards, in the compost, you know, just saving you know, those rinds or those pits, no matter where they are, like, you know, there's, there is, you know, truly to me, that is a silver lining for humanity, that you can, you don't need pre-bought materials <laughs> necessarily, you know, it's, it's about the education, it's about the openness, and it's about, you know, the, the fact that creativity is a human right, and that's something that can really, um, help us connect more deeply to a meaningful life no matter what those circumstances are. Um, so I do feel really grateful for this art form and this practice um, during this time and ongoing. And I also will say in terms of your question, just getting back to that, in terms of harvesting or farming, um, you know, I feel like one of my roles um, that I've narrowed down in over the years because I've worn many hats, but one of them is really, um, you know, just, just providing and working with these colors to show what's possible and, you know, to highlight the makers and the people that have those skills and the importance of collaboration. And so even on my travels, I took a sabbatical this past year and we happened to be in New Zealand in early March and just left at the end of August. Um, but I was locked down on a, on a sheep farm there, a coastal sheep farm. And it was, you know, truly pretty amazing just to even have these conversations with the farmers because here they are with these heritage sheep on like 10,000 acres. Um, and looking at the, the plants that are already growing there, both native, but also the weeds and the invasives, and even things that are very particular that tell the story of where that place is, particularly on this planet. And uh, it was really fun, even within lockdown, to experiment with their different varieties of wool and also with the plants um, and to work with them and to talk with them. And I love that kind of um, potential and possibility with natural dyes. I know I'm going on, so I'm going to wrap this up. Oh, that's good. That's but good. yeah, more in a deep dive, more in the yeah. deep dive. You guys, <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's deep, deep dive city after this with, uh, with these four, yeah. you can ask lots of, lots of questions. This is just like the appetizer for, for the deep dive conversations. But I think, I think uh, we have like one minute left. So I don't know that I should like fully. Okay, Kathy, I do have one for you because I'm gonna pull from this question Amber is asking in Q and A. So um, recently started natural dyeing towels, selling them online. It's been challenging and fun to learn what works well what's, and what is temperamental. I'm curious how we help others understand the importance of transitioning to natural items like these, even though care and use might look different or seem more intensive than synthetic items, but maybe you can talk really super briefly about kind of what it's been like, right? For um, trying to get people, brands, small brands, large brands to, you know, understand there's like how much work and messaging and communicating out and variations in color one will get. 
Yeah, I, I mean, if you're doing something where you're selling to an ind individual customer, I think them understanding your story and why you made the decisions you made and what you're offering them just imbues it with this amazing, um, uh, you know, this amazing quality that they couldn't get if they went to Target and bought whatever they're looking for. And that it has, it is special. I mean, all of the panelists have spoken to the cultural, historical um, beliefs that are embedded in the dyes that they're using and why they're using it and how they're using it. So I just think you have such an amazing story to tell that if you kind of just focused on that. And I also think that in terms of like use and replicability, I mean, you know, all of you who are growers out there, you never eat the same strawberry twice. So when it's dyed with a natural color, it, people should expect some level of variation. And as you become more and more skilled, then, you know, of course you get to control that, but I would say embrace all the differences um, for sure. I know we're out of time, so. I know, I know. And now I see all these other questions um, in addition to the other kind of hand raising questions. So, um, yep, we have to wrap it. I mean, it is at 1.30 that we're wrapping this up. Is that right, oh. Haley? <laughs> it is, unfortunately. Okay. So yes, go to the app and click on the deep dives for uh, different yeah. on this call and um, definitely ask those questions. So. Yep. So um, thanks everybody. Thanks all of you for, for coming. Thank to you. We'll see Thank you, you in the deep dive. All right, bye you guys. Amy, bye. do you have a deep dive? I don't, oh, but you, you do. Should, you should join one of ours. <laughs> all right. All right.